Joy Taylor, Director of Family Ministry here at Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. And I'm really excited to be doing some interviews with people in our congregation. We're calling this Your Story because I'm really interested in finding out about um, how God has been working in each of um, your lives, what the gospel means to you, and um, just getting to know one another better. You know, we're, we are in this time where we are being isolated from one another and that's really hard so hopefully these interviews and hearing about other people's journeys and what god is doing in their lives will help draw us together and um, become more of a church family even in getting to know one another better our hope is that by the time we all get to meet again we actually will know more about one another we'll know how to pray for each other and we'll know each other's hearts better because of this time together in interviews so jenny tell me a little bit about yourself so my name is Jenny James. I've been a member of Jacksonville Presbyterian Church since 1994. So I'm not going to do the math right now. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the church that I came to be a Christian at. I wasn't a Christian before then. And this is the church that nurtured me through to a, the faith that I have now. I'm not going to say it's a mature Christian faith because I think it's yeah, I'm working on it. Um, I am the daughter of Jim and Valerie James, who are also members of the church, and I have uh, two sisters and a brother, and my other sister, Kristen Olson, is also a member of the church, and longtime Sunday school teacher, and, um, and for between 1996 and 2004, I was the director of youth ministries here at the church, so this is really our church home. Mm. Um, Six years ago, almost six, he turned six next week, um, I had a son, Noah, and so I'm the mother to Noah Benjamin James, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about him mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. What is, um, what's your favorite part about this congregation and being part of this church family? When I worked here as the director of youth ministries, I had not ever been a part of a church before. Like I became a Christian and six months later the church hired me and so my faith grew in this place. And learning about other youth pastors and where they worked and just you know working with parachurch organizations, I really figured out that our church is a functional faith church. Like it asks you to live out Christ's words and it meant a lot to me as, um, as a new Christian because I I got to see the life application, and it wasn't just, well, I'm a Christian now, and I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven, and I get to spend the next 60 years doing whatever I want to do. It was really about um, like making my faith work, mm -hmm. and not, not work, but just have a purpose and, have, and bring meaning in my life, and it, it was a functional part of who I became as a person. In my 20s, it was important. Like I was really identifying who I was at that point, and... Um, this church helped me to identify those important parts about me and, and nurtured me along in that. Mm -hmm. Like I felt, um, when I first became a Christian, I really felt like this church put me in a cocoon and helped me just really change and develop and learn about Christ and find out how he loves me and, and in a real safe atmosphere. And then it also gave me the wings to try and live out that faith as the director of youth ministries when I had never really had a lot of experience. I had worked with kids for a lot in my life as a coach and, and teaching and things like that, but I had never done it in a, in a church setting. So it, it became a place of, of life development for me mm. um, in a lot of different ways, professionally and spiritually and emotionally and personally. And um, yeah, so... It's a lot to me. This church is a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. I like that you said it's a safe place because I feel like that too. That yeah. that that it's a it's a safe place to be authentic. I think and to be yourself, yeah. and people accept you for where you are and want to see you grow. I think so. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that about here too. Um. So tell me a little bit about your faith journey, and I mean, you kind of started a little bit, but where did you see God reveal Himself to you along the way? That's a lot, a lot of places. <laughs> Um, I think um, early on in my faith journey, when I first became a Christian, I was going to Bible study fellowship with my sister, and I was kind of, um, I don't know, negative towards it, and I kind of thought that Christian women were all 
they all wore, you know, like flowered dresses with lace collars. And I was like, I just not, I'm just not that person. And, and I didn't, I didn't see the whole, the whole dynamic of the Christian faith at that point. Um, but I knew that God was calling me. Um, and I just became a Christian on my own in my bedroom on my knees for two hours, you know, just Mm -hmm. talking to God. And that's how it happened for me. Um, and then that next weekend, I happened to be living in Portland at the time. And that next weekend, I moved. I didn't move. I came down here to visit my parents. And it was that Sunday that um, Pastor Larry Young asked if anybody needed to stand up um, and profess faith in Christ. And it was as if he was asking me to stand up mm-hmm. and do that. And I stood up. And I was the only one that stood up that day. But this is where I grew up. Like this, I went to Jacksonville elementary school and McLaughlin middle school and Mm -hmm. South Med. Like this is my home. So there were a lot of people here that knew me before and knew I wasn't a Christian. I think it was, um, I remember like Sarah O'Brien came up to me that day and said, you know, we've been praying for this for a really long time. And so that moment was very, um, it was just the start of something new. It was just the start of something great. And so I immediately moved back here and, um, started helping out with the youth group uh, just as a volunteer. And then six months later, they had, they uh, hired me as the director, interim, part-time <laughs> director of junior high. And it was really just kind of, can you help start a junior high youth ministry? And that's what I did for two years. And then after that, they it, it kind of morphed into a full-time director of youth ministry positions with junior high and high school. And um And my faith journey was exponential at that point. Like I was going to Bible study fellowship and whatever I learned that week, I would probably teach the kids that next week. Like, and, and it was, it just mirrored whatever I was doing in the youth group. And, uh, I was spending a lot of time in prayer and I was spending a lot of time asking God like what's next and just kind of following his lead. Cause I, I had never been to a youth group in my life when I was growing up. I wasn't a Christian, and I never went to youth groups. So I didn't even know what one looked like. Mm-hmm. So it was it was really just him being able to make it happen, and I didn't want to get in his way. Um, but I loved where I was. Like I like it just felt like exactly where I needed to be. And I saw God a lot in the changed lives of the students. You know, the ones who had never known that they were loved by the God of the universe, and it and it changed their whole trajectory in high school and who their friends were and, and how they interacted with others. And I mean, so I saw that I saw God work in the lives of my uh, adult volunteers, um, helping some through addictions and helping others into positions of leadership where they hadn't before. And, um, I just saw God working in ways in people's lives, like really like he was doing in my life, which was to fulfill why we were here in the mm-hmm. first place. Like I wasn't spinning my wheels anymore. You know, I had been in Portland working in advertising and I just felt like I was spinning my wheels. It's like, so I get up in the morning and I'm supposed to make a little 30 second spot so that somebody will buy a hundred pair of Nike shoes, hundred dollar mm-hmm. pair of Nike shoes. Like it didn't make any sense to me. Right. And I felt like I was spinning my wheels, but this felt like it had substance behind it. And, um, so I saw God, creating substantial people and Mm -hmm. substance in my life and that um and then his word was living in my heart and I was praying all the time and it was like I said it was like that cocoon of just I was just so immersed in him all the time and and he would show me ways like you know I had I had applied for law school and medical school and the Peace Corps and seminary and (laughs) this is the job that came up you know, and, and I, and all of those, I, you know, I, the only one I didn't get into medical school, but all the other ones I declined and said, I'll just stay here and work here, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it was like the, the perfect choice, um, for me. And I saw him doing that in a whole different other ways, you know, like when we would take a missionary trip, the plan that I had maybe wasn't the one that worked out, but it was really great what, what happened instead. And so I was trying to follow him and I saw him do great things you know and when you see great things done you think that's a great god Mm -hmm. yeah i want to worship that you know i want him to be my lord and savior like it 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 just fulfilled everything um for my life like what i was supposed to do Mm -hmm. so yeah that's super cool and i like i like too how um you're such a good example that god does you like you don't have to have everything figured out first or be at the the top of the faith game or something to make a difference and an impact in people's life. Like he used you as a brand new Christian to minister to all of those kids and you were learning right along with them 
but that's what's so awesome about God is he fills in all of our gaps and sometimes our gaps are bigger than others you know that he needs to fill Huge but he's gap. so faithful to to do that and if we're willing to use us right yes. where we are that's, that's really cool like I can remember sitting down with Larry in a professional meeting one time and saying so can you tell me what Easter is all about? Like, why is it such a big deal? <laughs> like, I didn't know anything about the church the stories and mm. the calendar and why we do you know, nothing. And Larry was such an incredible mentor and so just encouraging all the time. Like, he never looked at me like, you're a, a church idiot because I really was. He would just encourage me and, and he taught me and he was like, this is what we do and this is why we do it and this is why it's important. And, mm. um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know the difference between Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist. Like, I was like, I, I thought there was just like Christians and Catholics, and then like other people that weren't. You mm-hmm. know, like those were the big groups <laughs> for me. So, he, I learned everything at this church, and because God was faithful in that. Mm-hmm. So, that's cool. Um, so many of us know that you have a sweet boy Noah that you mentioned earlier, um, who's had medical issues that you've been dealing with yeah. since birth and actually yeah. pre-birth, right? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how God has just been working in your life and in Noah's life? I know that's another <laughs> big one. Like it's a big so one. many things, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's just the last six years of my life. I mean, there's like a whole huge yeah. story in the middle that, that pre Noah and post being youth pastor. And I lived overseas and I was mm-hmm. teaching overseas and, um, yeah, I mean, and I went to film school. I think there's all this stuff that, but even in all of that stuff, God was there in the midst of every single different thing I did. Like I didn't have to be working at a church Mm -hmm. for God to be doing incredible things in my life. So when I wanted to become a mother and I wasn't married and I was the religion teacher at an international Christian school, you know, I asked him, I said, would this be a problem if I come back pregnant sometime, you know? And, um, they had to talk about it with their board and mm-hmm. um, they eventually said, no, we feel like it's a life affirming choice. And so because of their encouragement, I went ahead and, and was artificially inseminated and Noah took on the first try. And, um, and so I was planning the whole time to live over in Korea where I was working and have him there. And we were going to have this international life. Um, but about 18 weeks into his um, gestation, they found that his bladder was enlarged. And at the time that you go in and say, is it a boy or a girl? Mm-hmm. They said, well, his bladder is enlarged. And I remember saying, it's a he? Mm-hmm. You're like, I didn't hear anything else. It was like, it's a boy, you know? And, um, and then they said, and then I remember thinking, well, that's good. Cause like when we go on long trips, he won't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> like he'll be able to hold it for a long time. <laughs> Uh, but it was obviously much worse than that. And it was, um, early enough in the pregnancy that it was going to be causing damage into his kidneys. And, and so that doctor immediately suggested we just get an abortion. And, um, and I, I said, no, I, I need a second opinion and that's not something I can, I can do right now and, or ever. And, um, so I came home at Christmas break, which was about 20 weeks into gestation, um, and got a second opinion from uh, OHSU. And both of the doctors up there confirmed that it, he had what's called a posterior urethral valve and possibly a thing called prune belly syndrome, which is a very rare condition. And it happens about one in 40,000 and usually boys. And, um, uh, it, but it causes a lot of problems in their, in their urinary system and their, um, you know, just like muscular system, like a whole bunch of uh, other problems. And they also suggested um, to terminate the pregnancy. And I said, you know, we just can't talk about this anymore. Like I'm done. Like don't even ask. And, um, and so after that, then they suggested I don't fly back because they weren't sure that the baby would survive week to week. And so I had weekly ultrasounds um, just to see how the, the baby was progressing and if it would survive and and it was that was terrible because you know you want their second and third trimesters to just be this glorious time of like this baby's growing and this connection and I was deeply depressed Mm -hmm. and yeah and those weekly um the weekly ultrasounds I finally just said I was going up to Portland every week for them from home and I thought I'm not going to do this anymore like if you if all you can give me is worse news every week, can't we just get worse news down here and I won't have to drive 10 hours to hear it? Yeah. 
And uh, so we did. I just, I just said, I'm not going to go up there anymore. And if you need to see it down here. So I had a really wonderful doctor down here. And she, we kept doing the weekly ultrasound. And she kept saying, this is going to be a difficult birth. And he's going to have a difficult life. And they were mostly concerned about the prune belly. Because um, I can just, he just basically can't survive out that. So I asked her if he, you know, if it was her child, would she do palliative care immediately? Like just not just hold him until he passed away or mm -hmm. um, but the other issue was that his bladder was continuing to enlarge um, because of this this piece of skin that was in his penis and would push back the urine and then it would push back up into his ureters and then it would push back up into mm -hmm. his kidneys and then would also um, I don't know if this is too medical but the urine is what is the amniotic fluid is made out of. And so he, when he didn't produ produce the urine, then the amniotic fluid would go down. And then they didn't know if he was breathing correctly. And then he might come out and not have, you know, uh, be able to breathe and his lungs wouldn't have developed. So it was this cascading effect. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just remember at that time, it was a really dark time for me spiritually. And I just, I was so angry. You know, I just felt like it was literally, um, descending into the valley of death you know just mm -hmm. taking a step every day and it was like i was walking on shale shale you know the, mm -hmm. the kind of that just slides you take a step and you just slide down and then it would and it just kept getting darker and darker and darker and and i can remember at that time asking my sister you know what did i do you know you feel this guilt like what did i do that made this baby so sick and um she brought up the story of blind bartimaeus because my family is steeped in God's love and mm -hmm. word. And she reminded me that it wasn't anything I did. It wasn't anything the parents did, blind Bartimaeus' parents. It wasn't anything he did, mm -hmm. you know, that that this was all done so that God's glory could be shown. And, and as comforting as that was, I was still mad. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like, I didn't want the suffering to happen because who wants that, you know? And you always want, as a as a Christian, you want to think that your life's just going to be super great and super easy and happy and joyful all the time. And there are those moments. I mean, I remember back to those years of being a youth pastor when it was so awesome all the time. Uh, hard, mm -hmm. but still awesome. And there wasn't the suffering mm -hmm. that I was feeling then. And, and uh, I really started to, to think about, you know, I understand now the suffering of Christ on the cross, you know, like what you would do for somebody you love. And I was like, if I could take this from this child and I still, you know, the baby was still in me. So if I could, if he could somehow transfer his sickness to me, you know, like, mm -hmm. and you just think about how you, how can I make this better? And there was nothing, literally nothing I could do. And there was nothing that I had done that made it happen. Mm -hmm. So it's completely out of, out of anything that I could do. And I can remember being super angry with God and yelling at God and telling him this is not how it's supposed to be. And just, I think back at like, I was such a petulant child to him. Like just, this is not what I want. And, um, and he was so quiet with me. Um, and I thought he was distant, but he was just letting me vent. You know, he was just letting me just be angry and it was okay you know as long as I didn't you know go out and sin in my anger you know um, as long as I was following his word and he just wanted me to let let and then you know he just um he was quiet for a really long time and that was painful mm. I was suffering because of that because spiritually I felt like I was um alone um, and I was surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, you know, like people in this church. Um, my dear friend Kay Berry would just come and get me out of the house. She goes, I'm taking you for lunch. And I would sit and cry at lunch with her. And, but she just, you know, she just let me not be in the valley mm -hmm. by myself. And that was really important. Mm -hmm. She didn't say anything monumental. She just didn't let me be alone in the valley. Mm -hmm. And my parents and my sister like took me to every single doctor's visit. My mom sat me every time that 
They would tell her her grandson was getting worse and she would just be a rock for me. So I saw God come up alongside me because of the cloud of witnesses, because I didn't want to see him right then. You know, I didn't want to, I was so angry with him, but he didn't, didn't leave me because he, he came alongside me with other people. Mm -hmm. And I can see that now, but I couldn't see it then. And uh, I, uh, I've come to really trust his plan in doing things, even though it's, it's suffering. He can't get rid of the suffering because we're in a fallen world and things happen here that aren't going to happen in heaven. There's just not going to be like that when we're with him in heaven. But here they do, you know, and he knows that it's painful. And I think a real moment for me after Noah was born was I had to go through some counseling about this. And I was seeing a Christian counselor and God moved from being the almighty God of on high. And literally in my head, I saw him just sit down next to me when I was crying on the floor and, and put his arm around me. And he became this God of everything to the God of my personal suffering. Mm -hmm. Like, like he knew he watched his son die on the cross. He knew what it was like to watch your son get poked by something else or get another surgery mm -hmm. or, and, uh, that was monumental for me, that moment of, he knows, he knows exactly what I'm going through. And I don't have to mad him anymore. And, and he's, he's hurting too. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was, that was amazing to me. Mm -hmm. So um, Noah was born and he ended up um, not having a terrible prune belly like they thought he would, which is a very grotesque condition almost. And, um, but he did have, he was an end stage renal failure. So his kidneys were failing mm -hmm. and, uh, there was just a lot like he had to have a kidney. I mean, he had to have a feeding tube placed 18 days after he was born and he had to get that, uh, posterior urethral valve ablaged, um, three days after he was born. I mean, he had six surgeries like almost immediately and he was in the ICU for a month and, and I was still in a place of, um, being angry with God. Um, but we, my mom and I went to Palm Sunday service, um, one time that I would get away from the, up in Portland, because we were up there, that's where I had him. And um, he said, you know, there is no resurrection without death. Mm. And that and th that reminded me that, that in, we're not gonna see the glory of God unless we get through the hard times. Because Jesus had to die for the resurrection, which was that great Easter morning. You have to go through Good, Good Friday, you know? Mm. and And, I, I started to see the other side of the valley at that point. Like after he was born alive and after, even though he was in ICU, I was like, I think I can see the other side of this valley now. And it was just about walking through that valley, which was still dark at times and still hard. But I started to see kind of a sunrise over the valley, you know, like the sun is over there. Like we're going to walk in that direction. I'm just going to keep walking towards him. And, uh, and we did that first year was about keeping him alive and it was about lots of medications and lots of midnight getting up in the middle of the night and you know a lot of mothers talk about you know, holding their baby at three in the morning and having to do feedings every three hours or whatever and no it never woke up in the nighttime hmm. because i fed him on a machine right like all night you know and so i would hook him up at nine o'clock and i would put it on his tummy and and I didn't ever want to pick him up when he was on the feed because I was all there's all these tubes and you know it was hard and and I think there was a lot that was missed in those you know early years of just being able to hold him uh, and I loved him but I was also I was also really confused about my role mm -hmm. a lot because I was doing a lot of nursing for him and not a lot of mothering mm -hmm. and. Uh, I can remember going to see his doctor when he was about six months old and we went every other week. Uh, but at this point, his doctor said, well, how's Noah doing? And I said, I don't know, he's your science project, you tell me. Mm -hmm. And I, th that's really kind of how I felt. Like it was everybody else's medicines and medications and surgeries and appointments, you know, like 
like that was just our existence and I didn't feel like I was his mother really I just kind of felt like I was the person pushing this science project around and and he looked at me and he goes you are his mother you know you are there a hundred percent of the time and you know him better than anybody else mm. and we are just his doctors you know we see him his lab work and 17 percent of that is the information we get you know you need to tell us and it switched something in my brain to be i am the leader of an expert team of consultants mm. on the on the most important thing in my life you know and and I feel like God was in that moment for me. Like he reworked my brain. He took the anger away and he took this, this confusion of who I was in this moment away. And he just said, um, this is who you are. This is your purpose. You know? And when I had that purpose, I was like, okay, I can do this. This I can do. Yeah. And, uh, God saw me through that cause he gave me that, that purpose and, and, and it was, was better it just you know it was hard still but I didn't feel like I was suffering as much mm -hmm. um, and he, I know it was alive I mean the, the joy of that had just been surpassed by this medical stuff you know and so I, at that point that I started to find a lot of joy in being his mom and and I saw God in moments you know there where um, you know like he wasn't he was supposed to have to get a kidney transplant immediately or be on dialysis mm -hmm. and they can't get kidney transplants that young. You have to wait till they're big enough to hold an adult kidney, which is about two years old. So we kept saying, well, he'll probably be on dialysis in a couple months. Mm -hmm. And it would come up and they'd go, oh, you know, his kidneys are doing pretty good. And, well, maybe in a couple months, you know, and it was this, because medical people don't necessarily see miracles. And every time we'd go in, he'd go, well, not this month. We don't need it this month. I'd be like, that's another miracle. Like, yeah. he did, like you guys are telling me it's supposed to be, and it's not. And it's mm -hmm. because I believe God's doing miracles. And so my mom is a true evangelist, and she would just be like, that's another miracle. Do you guys see what God's doing? You know, like, she would share this to everybody like that. God is every day. He shows up in ways you don't expect him to. Mm -hmm. And you, if you don't have your eyes open and your heart's turned to him, you're not going to see it. And she was the one that kept saying, this is God. God keeps doing this, you know? And he never had to go on dialysis. It's amazing. Right? I mean, he had his transplant at two and a half years old and never had to go on dialysis. And that that's a miracle. Yeah. I mean, he was in stage four kidney failure at birth. And God sustained him, you know, for 30 months. And you just think, that that's, I can't, unless you live it, People are like, well, wow, that's yeah. a coincidence or that's amazing. But it's like, no, that's, a, it's a miracle. Yeah, you, you don't know? understand. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to kind of live it. Yeah. So. Did you see through that time and did, were there medical care workers that you feel like were changed because of Noah's story? I, I hope so. Yeah. I don't, I can't tell of anybody who came to me and said I became a Christian because of Noah. Yeah. I have people that come to me who said his story has got me through a lot of hard times, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what you guys are going through and everything. And I mean, the way his life has ministered to others is nothing I could have orchestrated ever. You know, as a youth pastor, you want to, you want to orchestrate all of the great learning that these kids do, you know, and God was like, well, this is my, this is my gig, yeah, you know? Right. And it was like, I not, you know, all these people that his story has touched and, um, People that I don't even know, like people who know people who know people get, get back to me and say, you know, it got me through a really hard time or thank you for just encouraging us or, you know, we want to know how Noah is doing and, and that's all God, like all of, because, because for a control person like me, for somebody who wants to plan, mm -hmm. I didn't plan any of it, not a, a single thing and it got done anyway and not humanly done, you know? Mm -hmm. So I see God in that, and I just, yeah. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just that, yeah, if, through all of this, did you see, like, med were there people along the way, especially yeah. in the hospitals yeah. that just really saw what was happening and, mm -hmm. and understood it to be a mirror, something beyond what they could 
explain medically yeah. or scientifically. I think in some ways, like the nurse who took care of him after his ICU, when he, when he was in the PICU, you know, mm -hmm. pediatric ICU, and she was just so kind, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe it changed her. And there was a nurse that helped me when he was in the regular ICU, and I was like, I can't take him home. I can't do all this stuff. Like, what they cared for him all day was an intense mm -hmm. care. And she sat me down and wrote out a, like for a planner, she wrote out a calendar and a schedule of the day mm -hmm. and said, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. That, you know, and I hope that she remembers that moment with me that she had and says, you know, those are the kinds of things. When people show up and show over and above what they need to do, you know, that's, that's the goodness in people that only mm -hmm. comes from God. Mm -hmm. And... And she and I did not get along as like nurse and mother at all either. Like she was, the one who was like, Rawr, you know, and I was like, you're not doing the way I think you should do, you know. And, but she's the one who taught me that this is what you need to do every single second, every single moment. Mm -hmm. and so there, I'm sure. I, I think medical workers. I mean, like right now and what's going on in the pandemic and everything. Like they're true heroes, mm -hmm. you know, because they they choose a life of service. You know, and I know they get paid for it, but they are truly serving in the hardest parts mm -hmm. of a person's life, you know, and and they to do it without faith in Christ, I think would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So I hope that some of them through this would like you know, it, to get through something like this you need something bigger than you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. For sure. But Thank you for sharing all that with us. And I feel like it's so amazing how God knew exactly what you needed and was what you needed at each moment in order to grow your faith, but also to bring him self glory, you know, and yeah. I, I just feel like there's like this picture of, um, during certain times, like when you were in your darkness of instead of God throwing you just, just any kind of rope, it's like more like a rope of people, right. Who are hand to hand kind of, um, just there to help pull you out and, yeah. And allowing people to be part of that journey too is so. It's so something amazing. else I've learned through this is that there there's a weight of prayers. Mm -hmm. I I never knew that before, not even as a youth pastor. But that when people are a lot of people are praying for you, mm -hmm. and it's not a heaviness. It's not that kind of weight. It's like a it's like a foundation that you can stand on. Mm -hmm. There's like a, a sense of stability that comes when you know the cloud of witnesses is, are praying for you, you know. I don't love social media, but I love social media for this because I read those that people come on and we're praying for you and, you know, what else do you need? And, you know, I have felt stable in times of great instability mm -hmm. because of those prayers, you know, that people are are just speaking to, to God on my behalf. Like, they're out there. And they've created a, a stable foundation when the when the doctor comes in and says, "Okay, he's rejecting it," mm -hmm. you know, which is where we are right now, you know, and and it's like, okay, well, you know, what's the next thing? Like, I feel like it would be completely legit legitimate for me to go home and become an alcoholic <laughs> and not take care of my child, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, I feel like with what I've been through, I feel like nobody would think it was terrible <laughs> because. Who could get through yeah, this? Yeah, we totally you know? feel you for that. Right? Yeah. And I, I talk to mothers who are mothering healthy kids that are like, I just need a glass of wine, you know, all the time. And I'm like, I, okay, that I could legitimately be an alcoholic and totally it would be, you know, fine. But, but I haven't had to. And don't get me wrong. Like there's not, and I, because I donated Noah, I my kidney, yeah. I can't drink. And I never was a big drinker before, but now it's like, I don't, I don't even need it. Like, it's not going to be helpful to me. Like, this is not going to help me in this situation. And instead, I read those prayers that people send me, and it's like, you know, that's just a really firm foundation um, in a time when I am just trying to catch my breath. You know, like, I don't even have enough breath to, to pray right now, God. Like, and if I did, I'm not sure what I would say to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I, there have been some big things in my life that I prayed for that God literally came back and said, I'm going to answer you, and my answer is no. And that takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. You know, like, 
what do you, what do you mean? Like, this is a really good thing. Like, why wouldn't you answer that? Yes. And mm-hmm. here it is, you know? And so there have been times in my life where I'm afraid to put it out there. Like, mm-hmm. God, if I, if I pray this and you say, no, it's really going to be bad. Yeah. So I'm not going to pray anything right now. Yeah. And, and I don't think he likes that. You know, I think he wants me to be in communication with him, but in those gaps, when I, when I, my breath has been taken, when my spiritual breath mm-hmm. is gone, mm-hmm. you know, somebody else prays and they fill in that gap for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, it's still a process. I'm still trying to work through um, this relationship I have with God, you know, and you have all, I had all these plans for what I was going to, how I was going to bring my kid up in the faith and how mm-hmm. it was all going to look and how much he was going to love God all, you know, and we had a bumpy road, yeah. you know, from day one with him and, and spiritually it's like, God, I really want him to love you, but he's hurting, yeah. you know, he's already hurting and you need to show up for him. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you need to like man up God because, <laughs> you know, because he really needs you and. I'm only his mother. And as much as I'm a mother and I want to be a great mother, like, like he needs you, God, you know? And, and so we're working through this stuff like that, you know? And yeah. Yeah. And I want, and I want him to love God. Like I want him to be a man of God and a man of strong faith and a man whose heart, you know, seeks God in it. But like, I got to take him to get an IV on Thursday and, He's terrified. Right. He wakes up every morning to say the day. Mm. No, honey, we're okay today. It's not today, you know. And he's it's a phobia. Like he's real like this fear overtakes him. I'm like, well, perfect love drives out all fear. Okay, God, your perfect love. So I need you to drive out that fear for him because I can't do it, you know. Mm. And that's hard. That's yeah. really super hard. Because you want your kids just to always have this easy they, you don't want them to hate Sunday school and you don't want them to hate church and you want them to, you know, but we've had a rough start spiritually from the moment, you know, mm-hmm. and, and my friend, Mary O'Brien gave us this storybook Bible and he was like, I don't want to read that. Like he was like three years old and he's like, I don't want to, read that, you know, and I was like, do I push it? Do I, and I was like, I can't force this. You know, this has got to be something that he wants. And, you know, one time we were in the hospital and he was he was like I don't, I don't know why it hurts all the time and you know and I said you know what honey God's here he lower hurting he's here and then he wanted to know about God more and and we've started to read that Bible you know and it's just stories from the Bible that I you know and and it's I mean they're not the actual story you know the Bible it, it would be too much right but this was enough for him to be like. It's a rescue story. Aww. You know, that whole Bible is a rescue story. And at the end of every chapter, it's like, and God came to rescue us. So that made sense to him. Mm-hmm. You know, like he's, he will rescue us. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean we don't go through the hard times because then we wouldn't need a rescuer. Right. You know, but he's known the hard times. You yeah. know, like that's not something you have to convince him of. Yeah. He understands that in a way most of us probably don't. Right. Yeah. And, and he wants to know who God is in those times. You know, like that. That's like already a mature faith, I think, mm-hmm. you know, like that it took me like 10 years of being a Christian before I figured out that, well, God could get me through a hard time, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's hard as his mother to know, what do, what do, what do I do next for him? And, and I've started to really pray again on my knees mm-hmm. um, because there was a huge span of time that I couldn't because of my anger and because of the suffering and because of the hard work of taking care of him. And I'm like, I really need you, God, to tell me how to do this. Mm. You know, uh, how do I be a mother to a kid that's hurting and who is going to have a lifelong situation? And it's not unique, right? We all have this lifelong situation of sin. Like, but we don't, it's not as evident to all of us, right? So... And his isn't sin, it's just pain. Mm -hmm. But our sin brings us pain, and it's like, okay, this is the same story for every child, but his is very physical and tangible tangible right now when he's three or four Mm -hmm. or five, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes you have a child who gets into drugs when they're 17. That's 
the same, you know, and it's the same thing as a mother, like, I, I don't know what to do for them. How do I get this, get, get them through this? And mm-hmm. it's not me, but what can I do? And he shows up. Like, I just, we've read through that whole Bible now. And he wants to go again. Mm-hmm. And he picks out his favorite stories. And he knows different stories now. And he talks about Goliath. You know, like, Goliath is a big giant monster and he's mean and we want to kill him. And I'm like, yes, we do. <laughs> you know, it's like, because in his mind, this disease is like a Goliath, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, but God can kill him. Yes, he can. You know, like, there are things that he needs now in his faith that not, not a lot of five-year-olds do, mm-hmm. but God's still there in those. So, I, I see God in, in, in his life now. And I was terrified for a long time. I wouldn't, you know. But, um, yeah, it's helpful mm. for my own faith. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. I think it's probably hard to believe God sometimes, you know. For, yeah. Obviously, when you're going through those hard times. What what helps you through those times when you just want to throw your hands up and, be, and are like, okay, enough. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe that you're looking out for the good for those who love you. You know what I mean? Because I, I just feel like verses like that sometimes are so hard to grab onto when you're like, but I love you. Why? Like, how can this be for the good? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, I was remembering something that happened. Um, you said something that jogged my memory about, like just being able to trust God. And I, I remember sitting down and I thought, do I really believe God? This is after I'd been a youth pastor, after mm-hmm. I'd been, you know, and, and it's kind of when the rubber meets the road kind of faith, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, do I believe, do I believe there's a God that created the world? Because when I die, what happens, you know? And, and, and I got to this point where I was like, well, of course, like scientifically, like I was a biology minor in college. So scientifically, you know, of course there's a God. You can't dissect a human being and not understand that there's a designer. Like this was designed. This did not happen by accident. And you can't talk to an astrophysicist and he's like, there's a design to the universe. So there must be a designer, you know? And so that whole, like the belief thing, that was answered for me. Of course I believe. Of course I believe all of this, you know? And I looked at the historical accounts of Jesus. Like, there's no argument that there was a man, Jesus of Nazareth, he came. There's a Roman account of 500 people being, you know, seeing him resurrect. And, like, there's just stuff that, there's as much hard fact. I'm like, so yes, of course. Of course I believe. But what about the moments in your scripture that, you know don't jive with my experience and that for me was not about belief that was about trust Mm -hmm. and that was about do i really trust that you're good are you a good god or are you this crazy manipulator puppeteer like people like you know Mm -hmm. i had to figure out do i believe that he's good do i believe that he has my personal good you know um like in store, like for me, like, like, like he cares about that. And then will I give up that control and just trust it, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and those moments of, yes, I believe he's good. You know, it was through times in worship at this church. It was through times of talking to people and reading a little bit of scripture that I've been reading because I haven't been reading a lot, um, because sometimes it hurts. Mm-hmm. It hurts to read it, you know, and mm-hmm. it brings up more questions than answers. But yeah, he's a good God. He's a good God. Mm-hmm. And um, and then was it? Does he have my personal good? Uh, and and that just he just reminded me of all the stuff in my life where he was there, all the stuff that we talked about before. Like mm-hmm. he's been there. Mm-hmm. He was there. He did things a long time ago, and he's faithful. And so the faithful question was answered for me. Like, is he good? Is he faithful? 
And now is it like, will I trust him? Not can I trust him, because the can I trust him was answered. It was the will Mm -hmm. I trust him now. And I'm still working on that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never been married, but I find a lot of this relationship with Christ must be a lot like marriage. Like, I fall in love with somebody. You don't know anything about them. (laughs) I mean, really. Like, you fall in love with them and you marry them. Even if you been with them for like two or three years you still don't know that person and you don't know how they're going to change and you don't know what circumstances are going to change in your life and you don't know what hardships and like you don't know you know and is this a good person that I married you know is this person going to be loyal to me like all of those, okay now can I really love this person can I really trust this person will I give everything up to this person so that if this person said you know turn around and jump three times I'd be like yeah of course Mm -hmm. like I don't even need to know why anymore I'm still working on that on the I don't even need to know why Lord Mm -hmm. just go ahead I don't even need to know why and that's a lot for me because it was like no why like why would you you know Mm -hmm. Any sane person would ask these questions that's right that's a lot for all of us right (laughs) like to, to trust in that kind of a way right and that's the kind of trust where he says you know, Abraham, I want you to leave everybody and walk across the desert to a place you've never been. Go. Okay. You know, like that. Abraham, take your son up and sacrifice him. Okay. Like that kind of trust. I'm not there yet. But I see it, right? I see it in the scriptures and I see that God comes through even in those times and I want to get there. But it's hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Yeah, I... And I think it's probably something that's minute by minute for a lot of us, right? Right. One minute we can say, yes, we do trust in that way. (laughs) But then give us a slightly different circumstance five minutes later, and it might be a completely different answer. Or a pandemic comes. Yeah, that's right. You're like, okay. Wait, wait, I take it back. Right, right. Yeah. 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 But even then, the good thing I've learned is like, what is God doing? You know, Pastor said that last week. Don't Mm -hmm. ask what's happening in the pandemic this day. Mm -hmm. Ask, what is God doing in this day? So I've been asking that a lot. Like, God, just tell me what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like, I just want to be part of that. You know, I want to know what you're doing. And if, if you want me to do something, I'll do it. But otherwise, I just want to know what you're doing. Like, I want to see you work. Yeah. And, and that helps trusting, I think, for me to look for him. Right. So. That's awesome. Um, so Noah, so just, so the follow up and, and coming full circle here. So Noah's going back up to Portland to receive some yeah. treatments and cause things are up in the air again, right? Right. Yeah. In December it came back that he, um, was possibly rejecting the kidney and then came back after that, that he was in what they mm-hmm. consider rejection, not acute rejection, like immediate. Um, and they hope these treatments can, um, reverse that, um, so he's gotten two of these treatments, and they're like like cancer treatments. I mean, one of them is a cancer drug that he takes, and another one is immunoglobulin from other people. Like, mm-hmm. it's sourced from other people. Interesting. And it's just, which scares me yeah. as, a, as a mother. I'm like, oh, like, this is crazy. And um, But he's had two treatments, and they've gone very well. Like, a lot of kids have severe reactions to them, allergic reactions, or headaches, or it takes a long time to get through them and he was champ like Mm. nothing you know god really just saw us through those and the doctors come in and be like how's he doing i was like looks great like you know like we're still so the first two treatments went really well and now this third treatment um he doesn't have to take the cancer drug they don't you know so it's just an outpatient procedure so it's not nearly as involved we were inpatient in the hospital for the last two and um Although I'm waiting for a call from his doctor right now to see if we're even going to have it done. Oh, uh, right, because, because of everything going on. Of everything and the pandemic. And so, you know, is it an essential, like, is this essential or mm-hmm. is it not essential? Or, you know, and it feels essential. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be halfway through a treatment and not be able to finish it. So I'm like, okay, God, I am just trust you on this. Maybe mm-hmm. he doesn't need any more. Right. And maybe this is this is the way we're going to find way we're out. We're going to say no, you know. I just so there's a lot you're just not going to know. Right. Like I think you have to come to a place where you're like, I'm just not going to know that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, anybody who says, oh, I know it, I know it all. I know. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, just wait. <laughs> just wait, you know. And you have to be okay with mm-hmm. not knowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as a church, we can continue to pray just that these treatments work and that because there's a chance that then his, the kidney will continue to function okay. Right. Uh, so, so hopefully, if the treatments work well, then um, less scarring would have been occurring in the kidney mm-hmm. due to the increased antibodies that were in it. So if we can, we can decrease his antibodies enough so that it's not rejecting the kidney but we don't decrease his immune system too much that he gets a virus or something. It's this real fine balance that we're trying to hit. And he was there for a long time, right? For three mm-hmm. years after transplant, we were like, things were great. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is kind of, I think a minor hiccup. And if there's no scarring in the kidney, then the kidney will last longer, you know? And I mean, the half-life of a, of a live kidney donation is like 16 years, which means some people's go for 30 and some people's go for 10. You know, right. so we don't want his to go for 10 years. We want his to go for 40, you yeah. know, so we're trying yeah. to do as much as we can to, to decrease the scarring. Mm-hmm. And these treatments supposedly will help that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, you can keep praying that. I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't even know to ask people. Just yeah. pray for us. Yeah. Just pray for strength and resiliency and, and trust. You know, I. It, you get to a place where you're like, okay, go ahead, well, if he rejects the kidney and that's, and that's what's supposed to happen, okay. Like, do you just tell me what to do next? And that just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. just terrible. Yeah. You know, but I, people, we all are going to get there, aren't we? I mean, we're all going to get to a place where we're like, okay, well, if this is how I die, I just want to be, do it with you. Mm. You know? Yeah. So if this is the, the suffering we're going to be going through, I just want to do it with you. Mm. Like, I don't want to do it without you again. Or ever. Yeah. So. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything else that you feel like you want to, to share with us? <sighs> That's interesting. No, I just... I love this church. I think we need to just take care of each other. And like like everybody's taking care of me. And sometimes that means speak speak your friend's name out and just say, God be with them. Mm. Like that's caring for them. And sometimes it's taking them out to lunch when all they want to do is cry and and you just be there. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes it's sitting by the bedside of somebody who's dying and just holding their hand. And like it takes so many different forms to care for people. You know, and and everybody has different talents to do that with. Some people are the hand holders. Some people are the let's get up and you know dig this hole and change this thing and mm-hmm. and let's just love each other for their different talents. You know, and um, my sister and I are super different, but I'm really glad that we are because she's been able to be a person for Noah I couldn't be. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was the, uh, I've got to nurse him back to health. I've got to do this. I've got, and she was, she's such a lovely mom. I and mean, she's got her a son of her mm-hmm. own, and she's, she really was a lovely mom for him. You know, in times that I couldn't be that mom, or didn't feel, I didn't even feel like I was a mother. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt like I was a teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. we just have to really love each other for our differences too. You know, because God asks us we need he needs us different Mm -hmm. so just take care of each other and our differences yeah well thank you so much for um, sharing with us I just feel like your story and your life is such a just an amazing um, just evidence of God's how God meets each one of us individually at different places at different times he knows exactly what we need he sends the people you know to rescue us when we don't want to hear from him I think that's such an amazing um, just point that you made you know like when we're mad at God how he sends people who can love on us through his kind of you know show us his kind of love yeah when we're not wanting to accept it from him and then but then he's right there when we're ready Um, he knows exactly when we're ready to sit next when we just can only um, 
take it from him. You know what I mean? And when, when he's what we need, then he's that person to us too. And, um, and on top of that, he created the universe. Like, right. <laughs> right. You know, like he's the big picture and the little tiny detail God right. all at the same time. Right. Yeah. And the Holy spirit, right. Yeah. Who, right. who, who changes the atmosphere in a room, mm. you know, like yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Like, how could you do life without him? <laughs> Why would you want to? Why would you want to? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for showing us that and just sharing that, that slice of, of your life with us. It's yeah. amazing. And we love you and we thank love you. Noah and continue to lift you guys up. And we are blessed for sure. Mm. <laughs> mm.